In the last couple of videos, we've seen how to represent rational numbers using floating point registers. Now let's talk about how to perform arithmetic on these numbers. So let's start with addition. So I have two decimal numbers over here, the number 99.99 and the number 0 0.161. And these have both been expressed in normalized form over here because when you read things out of registers, what you're going to see is normalized numbers, right? So in this case, I'm going through a decimal example just because that's what we are more used to. But exactly the same algorithm also applies to binary numbers. So when I'm given these two numbers, the first thing I need to do is make sure that both terms have the same exponent. And the convention we're going to adopt is of converting the smaller exponent into the larger exponent. So in this case, the second number is shifted two places to the right, so it becomes 0 0.016, and correspondingly the 10 to the power minus 1 becomes 10 to the power 1. Right? So these two terms are exactly equivalent. What has now happened is that both of these terms being added have exactly the same exponent value. So once this is done, I can actually just place the two numbers one below each other, and I can then perform my addition operation. And note that this entire term has to be multiplied separately by 10 to the power 1. So once I've done this math, I get the result 10.015 times 10 to the power 1. Now this result is not in normalized form. That means it has more than one digit to the left of the decimal point. So it has to be renormalized. And so I shift it one place to the right, it becomes 1.0015 and the exponent becomes 2. Now I'm going to check to see if there is overflow or underflow, right? So in, in the previous videos, we had seen that with the IEEE 754 format, there is a certain maximum number that you can represent and a certain minimum number that you can represent. And so if the resulting value is higher than that highest magnitude or lower than that lowest magnitude, then this means that the number can't be represented with IEEE 754 format and we are going to signal either an overflow or an underflow. In this case, this number is well within the range, so we don't have to worry about that. Now you'll also see that I have an assumption up here that says that I only have a limited amount of hardware. That means I can only track two exponent digits and four decimal digits. Now in terms of the exponent digits, we are totally fine because you know we're just using one bit or one digit, and so we are well within this constraint here. But this constraint of four decimal digits is something that I run into multiple times, right? So when I had to shift this number to the right, you'll see that this one over here just kind of dropped off, right? And I was very quiet about it. But now you'll see that, you know, I'm only allowed to keep track of four digits per number, right? So I had one, six, one, and zero. And when I shifted two places to the right, I now am keeping track of zero, zero, one, and six. That last one didn't have room and just basically got dropped off. So that's an example where imprecision got introduced because I ran out of storage space in my in my adder, right? And at some point, you know, you are going to run out of storage space because all of your adders and your circuits are finite in size. Now, when I did the addition, I produced a result that again needed five digits, right? So this is where I again have to get rid of one of these digits. One option is to just drop the last digit. That would be like truncation. What is typically done is you end up rounding the value off, right? So in this case, this number here gets rounded up to 1.002. Okay, so because of this constraint of having a certain set of digits, I have to lose some of my precision. In some cases, I just drop a digit, and in some cases, I can do some rounding. So to increase the precision in general, you'll see that if a floating point adder is responsible for, let's say, performing 32-bit arithmetic, and is responsible for producing a 32-bit value, a 32-bit result, you'll see that it usually has a couple of extra bits to the left and to the right. And by having an extra bit to the left, you can keep track of the fact that sometimes your value becomes larger. And by keeping bits to the right, you can keep track of bits that spill over to the right. Those bits have to ultimately be dropped off. So the reason we kind of keep track of that extra bit over here is because it allows us to do a more precise job of rounding up or rounding down. So that's kind of what I've mentioned over here, that you know, because of my constraint of having only four decimal digits here, there were some errors being introduced, and the errors can be reduced by doing some kind of rounding off, and that rounding off is, is facilitated by having some extra bits to the right and to the left of the bits that you can actually keep track of. Now let's talk about multiplication. 
So this is actually a little bit of a simpler process, uh, and I'll again go through an example to show you what the steps are. So let's just take uh, a random example, 32.56 times 27.29, let's say. And I'm multiplying these two numbers. The first thing I need to do is, as, is represent them in normalized form. So the numbers that I would actually read out are 3.256 times 10 to the power 1 and 2.729 times 10 to the power 1. Now when you're multiplying these two numbers, in the result you're also going to be multiplying these exponent terms and so 10 power 1 times 10 power 1 becomes 10 power 2. Right? So you're just basically adding those exponent values to get the new result. Now I've said that you need to be careful over here because what gets stored in the registers is actually exponent value plus the bias. Right? So when you add these numbers up, make sure that you first take out the bias, add the, add the two exponent values, and then when you're putting the result back into the register, you have to add the bias back in. Okay? So just make sure that you handle the bias correctly. Then the next step is to multiply these significance, which are these numbers over here. Right? So in the previous videos, I had mentioned that the term that comes after the decimal point or the binary point is referred to as the fraction. If I include the digit to the left of the decimal point, the whole term is referred to as the significant. Okay, so the next step is to multiply these significant terms and then set the binary point correctly as well. So in some cases, the multiplication of these two numbers may produce a result that has only one digit to the left of the decimal point and in some cases two digits to the left of the decimal point. Right? And then you produce a whole bunch of bits over here. So once I've multiplied the significance, the next step would be to potentially normalize the result. So I may have to shift it one place to the right and increase the exponent term by one. And then finally you round off the result and then you finally assign a sign. If the signs of these two numbers disagree, then the new sign is going to be negative. Otherwise it's going to be positive. So this is how you perform multiplication. Now let's look at the MIPS instructions that are used to handle this floating point arithmetic. So until now we had only focused on integers and we had correspondingly introduced terms such as you know add, sub, mul, div, load word, store word and so on. And now you'll see that exactly those same sets of instructions are also used for floating point values and that is denoted by either adding a suffix of dot s or dot d where dot s re refers to in this case addition with single precision numbers and in this case, dot D refers to the fact that I'm adding double precision numbers. And similarly, you'll see sub dot S, sub dot D, mul dot S, uh, mul dot D, div dot S, div dot D, and so on. What you'll also see is a set of new branching instructions that look at floating point values and then you know decide if the value is greater than, less than, equal to, and so on. Right? So the format for those instructions is, is shown over here. So for example, I would do compare see if two registers are equal and I'm comparing single precision values. So that's what an instruction like this denotes. And you'll see that what is being done here is a comparison of registers F1 and F2. Right? And I'll get to these register types in a second. Okay? But I'm essentially comparing two registers. Now note how I handled this for integer values. Right? When I was comparing integer values, I said branch on equal to $S1 dollar zero and then some label over here telling me where I should jump right so that instruction had a format where I had two register operands and then I had an immediate constant that told me how far I had to jump now in this new format with floating point instructions you'll see that that label is missing right so essentially an instruction like this gets converted into two instructions one of which performs the comparison and the second one that actually does the branching. So there are two more instructions over here that say that check the condition of the previous comparison operation. If that comparison was true, then you jump to this label. Or you can use the second instruction which says check the previous comparison operation. If that result was false, then you jump to this label. Right? So an instruction like this, which was fairly compact in the integer space, has now become a two instruction sequence in the floating point space, right? So why was this done? So this has historical reasons. So in the past, we didn't have enough transistors to support a floating point unit on the processor itself. So a normal integer processor 
was accompanied by a separate chip which had a floating point coprocessor. So the math would get performed over there and then you would communicate the result to the main processor and that would check to see how far you had to jump. Right? And that's the reason why you'll see terms like C1. So C1 refers to coprocessor 1. So the way these processors work is that they perform the comparison. They have an internal bit which gets set or reset as a result of that comparison. And then you have a second instruction that examines that bit and decides where to go. Now, I already gave you the punchline over here where I was using special registers F1 and F2. So essentially, there is a separate register file that handles these floating point values. And they are referred to as F0 through F31. A single position value is stored in one of these registers. It's a 32-bit register. But if I want to store a double position value, that gets spread across two different registers. So it would use registers F4 and F5. So it always uses the even numbered register to store the first 32 bits and the odd numbered register to store the second 32 bits. And these are always referred to by the even numbered register. So a double position instruction will have register operands that are even numbers. You also have the standard load and store instructions. So load word into coprocessor 1, store word from coprocessor 1's register file into memory and so on. In some cases, you may also want to move values between an integer register file and a floating point register file. And there are special instructions that do that as well, right? But otherwise, any add.s instruction, for example, is always going to have floating point registers as the two input operands. But a load and store instruction will have one floating point register as one of the operands. And the other operand, which specifies the address, will always be an integer register, right? Because addresses are still dealing with integers. And so the address is always produced by an integer register. But the register that is being loaded or the register that is being stored into memory, those can be floating point registers.